This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. When two best friends take a kayaking trip, they're hoping for nothing less than a great adventure. They think they're invincible. They soon find out they're not. Powerful currents and bad weather quickly expose how one is woefully inexperienced, placing them both in grave danger. Friendship is tested. Loyalty questioned. In a bid to get help, they separate. And what was supposed to be fun spirals out of control into a fight for survival in I Shouldn't Be Alive. Saul Kinderis has planned a week-long kayaking trip with his best friend. They're after fresh air and exercise, and where they're headed, there's plenty of both. My plan is to hit Doe Bay. It's got uh, two hot tubs, one cold tub, you know, um, clothing optional, which generally speaking means no, you know, nobody wears a stitch. Saul's pal Larry Kaiser is driving up from Seattle. He and Saul might be considered jocks, they're great friends and great rivals. The goal was to head there and take her clothes off and hit on women, basically. I mean, that was the goal. The San Juan Islands lie northwest of Seattle in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The plan is to kayak north from Washington Park on the mainland to Strawberry Island and camp there overnight. The following day, they will continue to cross the Rosario Strait to Doe Bay, where the hot tubs await them. It is one of the most beautiful areas in the Northwest and attracts sea kayakers from all over the world. But these otherwise inviting waters conceal deadly forces, powerful currents and riptides that every year claim the lives of the over-adventurous. Saul organizes the entire trip, bringing the boats, the gear, life jackets, even the food. All Larry has to do is show up. As usual, he's late. You're late, Larry. You're late, Larry. Four hours. Four? So you're going to be up for this? Yeah, I'm up for this. Fat tourists like you can do this work. I don't see what the problem's going to be. I'm up for any kind of challenge like that, any kind of physical challenge. Especially if Saul throws that at me. We tended to compete in almost anything. Ah, chop, chop, Larry. It's that kind of relationship that I think you know, kind of got us in trouble here in this situation. Put your you way to the butt, you know that. Even though they are four hours behind schedule, thanks to Larry, they set out in fading light and head for Strawberry Island, a three mile paddle across the Rosario Strait. Anybody that knew us at that age would have predicted the outcome of the trip before we even launched. Two guys that thought they were indestructible, very competitive. Whoa! <laughs> we have a winner! I don't think either one of us at that time had the wisdom to understand the dynamic. In these waters, trips in broad daylight can challenge the most experienced sea kayakers. At night, it's a whole different ball game. It was unnerving setting out at night. That danger is exciting. It's a thrill. I keep going to the left. Huh? I keep going to the left. Adjust your rudder. Rudder? Yeah, with your foot pedals, you know? Foot pedals? What are your feet touching? Nothing. Nothing? Are you sure? Yeah, I said nothing. Did you even adjust the foot pedals? No. Everybody adjusts their foot pedals before setting off. Edge me within reach of your bow line. What's that? Your bow line? Yeah, I know what you said. What is it? It's your bow line on your bow. 
Oh, that? Yeah, bow line. Sorry, I thought you meant something else. It started to dawn on me that Larry is, uh, you know, kind of faking the, the expertise on the kayaking. That's the first time I'd set foot in a kayak. I'd never been in one before. You know, looking back, I'm thinking, what the hell was I doing? What was I thinking? What if we tip over? We don't. What sane and reasonable person would cut across a channel at night the first time in a boat? I was getting a little motion sickness because of the waves and stuff, and pretty soon I'm just going to have to start heaving. The swell of the ocean is confusing Larry's body. As a result, nausea is triggered. Inside his body, muscles squeeze his stomach repeatedly until Larry and his lunch part company. A couple of times I'd puke my guts out over the side of the boat and just let go. Nothing I can do about it. Did you have a big lunch in Seattle or something? After three hours of strenuous paddling, Saul and Larry arrive at Strawberry Island. But as they make their approach, Saul realizes the tide has turned, and their late departure looks like a big mistake. Powerful currents are now converging in a whirlpool of turbulent waters, known as Witch's Cauldron. This chaotic sea stands between them and the beach, the only safe landing spot. We're here. Witch is called. Strawberry Island is dead ahead. Where? Up ahead. Can you hear it? So all I hear is thrashing waves. I can see waves are smashing and crashing on the rocks up there. The wind is picking up. It's hard to hear. And it's just looking pretty nasty up there, too. And I'm just thinking, well, this doesn't look fun. This is the plan. There is only one beach on this island, only one slot in between the rocks. We can't miss that slot. I'll paddle in first. When I land on the beach, I'll wave my flashlight. That's your signal. We're gonna land on that. Aim for the flashlight and paddle hard. You got it? Yeah, aim for the flashlight. Saul needs to hit the beach. If he doesn't, things are going to get serious. I can see, you know, the rocks up ahead. Water is flying everywhere. It's just really hairy out there. The flashlight I have, you know, it's just not that bright. So I know I'm not going to see shore until I'm probably 30 to 50 feet off. And uh, by that point, I better be in that slot. Saul approaches the island at speed, but he's not in the slot. sees my headlamp kind of waving around a little bit and so he's figuring I must be waving him in here goes I could see him coming in he's aiming for the flashlight just like I told him to and that flashlight's on my head very scary situation totally caught us off guard. It just happened in a split second. Stop! What? You okay? What the hell was that? You tell me that! We crashed! Just get me the hell out of here! Uh, they gotta reach those books. The kayaks contain everything they need in order to survive. Okay. Come on, move, move. Uh, you really need the book. Yes! We need them! Well, we're dead! Please get the hell out of here! We're not gonna get out of here! Look, if we don't get there! Get out of 
We got four days worth of food on the boats. Got enough fresh water for maybe two or three days. Without it, we're screwed. Saul and Larry struggle to get their kayaks out of the surf. Their survival depends on it. We're good. Food, water, and clothing are all stashed in their boats. I thought you said there was a beach here. Yeah? Well, I lost it. So how the hell do you lose the beach? I misjudged it, okay? <laughs> it takes everything in them to drag their boats to shore. It was a pretty hairy situation. It was a very hairy situation. It took us probably 15 or 20 minutes just to get our boats up out of the water onto the beach. Even the weather turns against them. We could have been killed. Yep. But we weren't. <laughs> ah. God. Saul, so all my stuff is wet. Did you even seal this properly? But this is broken. No, it's not broken. Whatever, all my stuff is wet. What am I going to do now? His thought that you just threw your stuff in it, you threw it in the kayak, and it was waterproof. Get out of your dry suit now. You get into this. This is your bag. Yeah, do you want to share it? What? Well, then. I have dry clothes. I can sleep in them. My sleeping bag, all my clothes the gear I had, it's all just drenched. At that point, he was probably a little pissed. And for good reason. Larry was more or less along for the trip. If I got in trouble, he wasn't going to be able to help me because we were so far out of his element. After a cold, wet night, Saul has second thoughts about the trip. He might be able to make it to Doe Bay, but he doubts Larry can. The trip I planned isn't within our reach. Not for the two of us together, it's not gonna work. It just wouldn't be a prudent thing to do. So we're still going to Doe Bay then? The trip is over. Oh, it speaks. Your stuff will dry. One of us will end up hypothermic. Larry's clothing is all cotton. It's so absorbent, it can hold 25 times its own weight in water it'll take forever to dry. He didn't have any polypro or wool or anything else. He brought uh, t-shirts and a couple pairs of jeans, cotton, you know, the, the death fabric, uh, guaranteed hypothermia. So the crash last night was totally my fault. It had nothing to do with well, you. Larry, man, we're bagging it. I agree. Hey, do I get a say in this? Because I agree with you. Pack your stuff up, man, we're going. The trip is screwed, you know. He is pissed off, he's upset, but this always happens between us in all these little things we do. Did you adjust your rudder? Larry, now. Okay. Saul is the expedition leader. He likes being in charge. There's a tide window. I'm not missing it. After what happened the day before, Saul is determined to take off before the tide turns. They have just 40 minutes. If they leave it any later, they risk being swept out to sea. But they need to make a crucial decision about which route to take. Okay, Larry, I'm gonna give you three options. I don't think I can count that high. Quit joking, either you listen to me or you're on your own. Now, this is Strawberry Island now. That's Washington Park with our trucks. But this is the Rosario Strait between us and home. Option one. This island back here has a cabin. We knock on their door, ask for help. Option two, we hug the shoreline along these couple of islands to Guema's Island here. We stash the boats and take the ferry home. I'll get the boats another day. Three, this is the toughest option. We paddle back the way we came, three miles across the Rosario Strait. Now, I can do any of those, so you tell me which one you want to do. Larry's being challenged. Did you even adjust the foot pedals? So you're going to be up for this? This is the toughest option. So when your body you know? Testosterone pumps into his bloodstream, making him more aggressive, more assertive. 
His brain is now flooded with the male hormone. There's only one choice he can make. I can do any of those too, so... Let's paddle back. You sure? Yeah, man, paddle back, bring it on. You don't tell somebody you've competed with all your life in a, in a variety of sports that I can do any of these, which one do you want to do? Because what you did, you just threw down the gauntlet. What's he going to pick? He's going to pick the toughest one. He can paddle across a channel. I can paddle across a channel. I can swim across it. I can cycle 150 miles if I want to. I can run a marathon. I don't care. He's the same way. But when we get together, maybe we don't make the best decisions as a team. In a race against time, Saul and Larry start their return journey to safer shores. They have just 40 minutes to cross three miles of open water before the tide changes and the strong currents pull them out to sea. It looks pretty ugly. Yep. You sure you're going to be up for this? Yeah, I'm up for this. Are you up for this? We got 40 to 45 minutes to make this crossing before the current gets too strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Paddle hard. I'm not an idiot. In the area we were crossing, the current was supposed to hit five knots. Olympic medalist uh, kayaker isn't going to break five knots for anything more than a really short course. Hey, Saul! Hey, I'm taking on water here! Oh, an idiot, why is he so far ahead? Saul! We'd agreed when we launched, since I didn't have a spray skirt that fit his boat, that uh, I wouldn't put on my spray skirt either. And I'm like, you know, what's the spray skirt? What, what is it, what's it for? And he's like, well, it's to keep water out of your boat. Don't let the waves hit you side on. And dig with your paddle. Take a 70 degree angle, carve up the slope. Everything I'm telling him is just blah, 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 blah. He ain't listening. Hey, I'm still taking on splash here. Larry, do you understand anything I'm saying? Saul, I have never been in a kayak before, okay? You said that you had. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. You better learn and hurry. He's trying to get me to put my nose into the wave. Pierce right through it. Take on the least amount of water possible. Number one, I didn't have the skill to do that at the time because I still was learning how to kayak, essentially. But number two, the waves were coming all the time. They're up against the clock. A southerly wind is whipping up the waves, blowing them against the current, making their crossing slower and more dangerous. It was getting pretty bad out there. Every few minutes, it's getting worse and worse. My boat's filling up with water. I could sense some panic in his voice. He knew that we had a limited amount of time to get across the channel. We hit a point where when it got really rough, just all our forward progress stopped. I mean, you know, 20 minutes, we were roughly halfway. 40 minutes, we were roughly halfway. An hour, we were roughly halfway. Now I'm starting to get both angry and a little scared. He's got the good dry suit on. I'm wearing a shorty wetsuit. It's November. Not only is the air cold, so is the sea. A dry suit is designed for diving in cold water. Saul knows in these conditions that the difference between wearing a dry suit or a wetsuit can be the difference between life and death. Larry, damn it, your shoulders are slack. Okay. Forward. Okay. Paddle. Okay, okay. Damn it, okay. man. Are you a complete idiot? Blood pressure is definitely cranking up there. I figured that it was a good possibility that we could get killed. So wait up, man! I was starting to have these doubts in my mind that we were going to be able to stick together. Your loyalty is to your friends, but then your first loyalty is to yourself. So get the hell back 
here. So, wait up! Sooner or later, I'd probably take a wave. If I fall in, I'll go hypothermic within probably 20 minutes to half hour. The key for my survival and even his survival was that I make it to shore and get help. You don't leave your buddies. You don't leave your friends behind. Saul! I love the guy, but he left me. Get the hell back here, man! I need that pump! You need to bring me the pump! Saul, I need that pump! I was just applying as much speed as I could, trying to visualize the boat as being a speed boat, as if it was surfing over the tops of the waves. Adrenaline surges through Saul's bloodstream. His muscles, now fed with extra energy, increase his strength and heart rate as his body kicks in to fight or flight mode. But Larry is in another place altogether. My boat was completely full of water at that point. My feet were covered, my shins were covered, it was coming up my legs. And that's when I started to get that sense of panic. And I knew, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. It's, this is no longer just a nice, fun, regular outing. I'd never applied that much power before into the boat. It was just crank it. As Saul powers through the waves, Larry goes nowhere. Everything stopped. It wasn't a big wave, it was just a, a small push. And this little push it just pushes me over. water now not a fun feeling I'm very aware of two things the current is moving Larry further and further away we got darkness at you know 3 30 4 o'clock in that range I, I need to phone I need to call 911 they've only got an hour and a half to find Larry before darkness falls I'm getting scared at that time and that's when I first started to realize that man I am really, really getting more and more in trouble here. After being left on his own, Larry has capsized in the middle of the Rosario Strait, a mile and a half from the shore. There is only an hour of daylight left, and he's in the grip of a powerful current that is sweeping him towards the Pacific Ocean. I just talked to the police boat. Did they find him? I'm afraid not. It's too rough out there. Too rough? Larry's out there. You're telling me it's too rough? He could drown. I'm starting to feel the self-doubt. Did I make the right decision? Where is Larry? Is Larry alive? Did I just consign my friend to death? I'm out here all by myself in the middle of a channel, in the middle of the winter. It's getting dark, and there's no one here to not only save me or rescue me, but no one knows where the hell I'm even at. What do I do? I mean, what are my options at this point? I had no options. It's either stay with a boat and hope someone comes to get me, or I'm gonna swim. And that's what I did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna swim. Larry now swims for his life against a current that is pulling him out to sea. The dry suit he's wearing will keep him warm in the icy waters, but for only so long. So you say your, your buddy Larry was wearing a dry suit? Yeah, it's a pretty good one. Yeah, seven, eight hours. Yeah, but Larry's an athlete. He's a national class runner. 
that was the first time that I started to feel like I'm here, I'm warm, I'm dry, and I hope Larry's alive, but he might not be. I was thinking, okay, I know me, I know Larry. If there's people that can survive for a long period of time just by being stubborn and being fit enough, we fit that description. Rescue boats search a grid pattern based on Larry's last known position, but in the pitch black of night, they fail to see him. Like a nightmare unfolding before his eyes, Larry sees them. I'm looking around and I can see kind of, you know, boats out there crisscrossing back and forth. Help! Help me here! Help! The rescue boats, I must have looked like nothing in the water to these people. Help me here! Here! I'd go down in a swell and come up and see all the lights on the land and the boats and I'd go back down and see nothing but water around me and I'd go up and down and, you know, they're always just right back searching where I just was. I was a small person in a very, very big place. A rescue team discovers a kayak on one of the islands. It's Larry's. Bravo, do we have a visual on a kayak on Mears Island? As soon as I heard that they were, you know, that they'd spotted the kayak, it was just happiness. It was like, oh, great, Larry's fine. He's there. He landed the boat. We're going to have a great outcome. Is there a paddle with the boat? Affirmative. Any gear with the boat? Negative, empty. No sleeping bag? Dry bag, nothing. Correct. The boat's empty. <laughs> Great. What more clues could you need? I mean, paddles with the boat, sleeping bag's gone. The guy's alive. I'm in trouble now. This isn't this isn't fun anymore. I mean, even up until then, I'm just thinking, you know, whatever. You know, I can deal with this. But now I, I'm in trouble. Powerful currents from three different channels converge, and Larry is caught in the middle. I've got this big phobia about being swept towards the ocean. That's a very scary thing. I could head out to the Pacific here any time. I saw a buoy off to my right, up ahead some, I don't know, 100 yards or so. I'm thinking, you know, I'm in so much trouble now that I'm going to see if I can maybe latch onto this buoy and just hang with that and not get drug out to the ocean. I kind of put my head down and I started swimming again. I started kind of cutting diagonally across to get to the buoy head down, swimming away. Look up to kind of see where, where I was going. I was already past the buoy. Before, I keep telling myself, I'm in trouble, it's getting worse, this isn't good. But when I miss the buoy, that's when I first started saying to myself, you may die out here. <laughs> I may not get out of this alive. Larry has been in the frigid waters for over six hours. He's exhausted and cold. He's been swept four miles down the Rosario Strait that eventually empties into the Pacific Ocean. Little does he know that since his kayak was spotted on land, the rescue teams are following the wrong scent and are no longer looking for him in the water. Yes, he paddled here. He left the red paddle with his boat. You see red paddle? The red paddle is the storm paddle. It's tied to the boat. The boat with nobody in it would still have the red paddle. 
Did you say red paddle? Yes. No black and white paddle? Negative. How many holes are in the top of the boat? Two, one for each person. No, no, it's a, it's a one-man kayak. That's the storage hatch. Is there anything in there? Yes, there is gear in here. A dry bag with what feels like clothes and maybe a sleeping bag. He's not on the island. It's Larry's kayak. Damn it! But it came ashore without Larry. At this point, man, we're in trouble. It's just this feeling of like, why did I invite him on this trip without making sure that we're both ready for this trip? <laughs> just an incredible sense of no hope again. Just no, it, it's all over. It's all over. This boat just washed up here. It was this feeling of he's dead. We're going to find the body. You realize that somebody that you're fairly close to is no longer here, and you're the one that killed him. Yes, Mrs. Kaiser? It's Saul Kanderis. I'm sorry to call you so late. It was the hardest phone call I've ever made. It was um, nothing that in my life I'd ever expected myself to have to do was call somebody and say, hey, you know, I took your son out. It was supposed to be fun. I got him killed. Here I am. I'm in the water. It's dark. It's cold. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. No one can see me. Everyone's looking for me. They're, and they're getting farther away from me. And there's nothing I can do about it. At that point, I was fully thinking, there's just no chance in hell I'm ever getting out of this water alive. I'm dead. I really thought, just end it now. Why even bother with this? I was just gonna like dunk my head under water and just drown myself. You think about weird stuff like that. It just came out of nowhere. And I just burst into tears thinking about my mom and I love my parents, I love my dad, I love my family. What do you say? Um, you know, thanks for you know being my mom, quote unquote. I mean I was ready to die. As Larry is swept towards the mouth of the Rosario Strait, he passes the last few islands that lie between him and the Pacific Ocean. I can see this lighthouse to my right as I'm coming up on it. And it's, it seemed like I'd gotten a little closer to land. And I'm thinking, you know, I can maybe swim for that. And I start swimming and I can see myself making progress. And it's getting closer. Keep swimming, it's getting closer and closer. I'm like, my God, I am gonna get out of this. I'm gonna get out of this. I come up onto shore and there's this big rock right there and I just swim up and put my arms around this rock. This is the most beautiful rock I've seen in my life. That's all I could think of, nothing else, just, just lie there and enjoy this stupid rock. Feeling of, of relief. If you've ever been in a situation where it's literally life and death, and you feel that you've cheated death. It doesn't get much sweeter than that. Too exhausted to find the lighthouse, Larry stumbles inland and collapses on the ground. At that point, I still have no idea what I'm going to do 
but I was just basically trying to bide my time until I got light out. I really couldn't sleep. I was too worked up. Larry is mentally and physically exhausted, but he's exhilarated at just being alive. His mind is working overtime. I thought about, what the hell is Saul doing? Was he having a beer with some friends in some bar? Did he go home and is he watching TV right now? Is he thinking, oh, I wonder where Fuzz is at? What is this man thinking? Is he thinking that I'm dead? Is he thinking he killed me? Is he thinking he's responsible for killing me? I, I thought about that a lot. Larry now faces a bitter night in near freezing temperatures without food, water, or warm clothing. Mike? 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 What? What time in the morning did they start the search again? Probably first light, 5.15. Okay. I don't think anybody there could have been harder on doubting my decision than I was. If the outcome was good, then I'd be telling myself later it was the right decision. If the outcome was bad, I'd uh, take that doubt with me for the rest of my life. After six and a half hours fighting for survival in the water, only snatches of sleep, no food, and nothing to drink, Larry still has to find his way back to civilization. The game plan was to head back towards Lighthouse. If there's the phone or some communication, I can get the word out that I'm okay. At that point, to me, in my mind, absolutely the worst was over. hiking towards the lighthouse. And I'm thinking, what is this? I'm on another island right now. It's another mile across to get to land again. I don't see any helicopters. I don't see any planes. I don't see anything. So I just figured they called it off, they've given me up for dead, and I'm on my own again. Here, I'm back to square one. I gotta go out and get going here. The decision to get back into the sea isn't an easy one, but Larry doesn't believe that he really has any other choice. A mile of water now lies between him and safety. nervous I I kept looking around initially at first thinking am I making any ground am I making any headway here am I getting any farther away from the shore and I could tell I was so that gave me some confidence I'm literally right in the middle I was overcome with this just strange bizarre feeling I stopped swimming I turned around in the water, and there behind me was this giant helicopter hovering right where I was standing. You've got to be kidding me. This can't be happening. Everything I do is not the right decision. What's the first thing they tell you to do when you're lost? Stay put. So in hindsight, yes, I should have stayed the hell where I was at. Hello? 
No one was around. It was uninhabited and... Hello? At that point, I heard a helicopter was kind of coming closer my way. And I kind of peered over the treetops and... Some guy pops out, he comes running over to me and, you know, are you Larry Kaiser? And I just go, yeah, we got a lot of guys looking for you. And I'm just like, yeah, I know, I've been watching you all night long. You guys have always been right behind me. Oh, come on, let's go. Then the helicopter kind of flies overhead and the guy there crewing the station just jumps up and says, God, great news for you. I don't remember how many stop signs we ran, but we damn near beat the helicopter to the hospital. No, nope. the zip's broken. I'm going to have to cut you out. I remember seeing him walk into the room that I was at, and his eyes were wide open. Yo, Larry. You okay? Lift. Hey, son. The main thing I remember is being so happy to see him. It was like better than any Christmas present. His, your buddy's still alive. You must have left me. Sorry, go ahead. I'm just glad you're okay. Yeah, me too. I wanted him not to feel guilty. I wanted him to hopefully be relieved in the fact that I'm okay. So don't knock yourself up about it. I believe I made the right decision, but there was a huge amount of luck in that. Do I hold a grudge against him for, for doing that? No, I don't, you know? Um, I don't. I wish he would have made a different decision. Sure I do. You know, I wish he wouldn't have left me. Either one of us, but especially Larry, could end up dead out of that experience. And uh, that, that really changed me. Now, for a, a year or two after my situation happened, it, it was on my mind every day what, what I went through and what I'm thankful for. Saul and Larry have remained good friends. They still go kayaking together and have even returned to the waters that put their friendship to the ultimate test.